Welcome to Crosstalk, I'm Peter Lavelle. Turkey and its road ahead. A little over a year ago, Turkey was being hailed as the new leader and model for the Muslim world. Among many Turks, the Ottoman legacy is again back in vogue. My, how things have changed. Instead of focusing on a foreign policy of no problems with its neighbors, particularly Syria, is Ankara's foreign policy today in disarray? To crosstalk the new Ottomans, I'm joined by Gareth Jenkins in Istanbul. He is a non-resident senior fellow with the Institute for Security and Development Policy Silk Road Studies program. Also in Istanbul, we have Icon Erdemir. He is a Republican People's Party member of parliament. And in Washington, we cross to Ilhan Tanir, the correspondent for Vatan Daily and a fellow with the Henry Jackson Society. All right, gentlemen, crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want. Uh, Gareth, I, if I can go to you first, what is neo-Ottomanism? Uh, and is it a good idea? Well, basically, I think it's the idea that there should be a Turkish sphere of influence in the Middle East in particular, um, in those territories which were once ruled by the Ottoman Empire. And uh, it's a very simple answer to your question. No, I don't think it's a good idea, and I don't think the people in the region want it. Okay, can you give me two reasons why it's a bad idea? Well, one is that I don't think anybody in the region wants to go back to the age of imperialism where you have one particular country lording it over the others. And the other is that there are many sectarian divisions uh, within the region now, both between the Sunni and Shia, and there are also divisions on, on ethnic uh, grounds. So if you put all of these people in uh, to one particular block, you're both going to get a basically undemocratic uh, system, but you're also going to get divisions and tensions within that block. So I don't think even if Turkey was able to establish it, it would be a very healthy uh, model to, in which to go into the future. Okay, Ilhan, Washington, D.C., what do you think about that? Because the term exists, people are talking about it, a lot is written about it. Uh, yes, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, well, first of all, Turkish administration, I mean, uh, Foreign Minister Davutoglu has been denying that uh, there is any uh, Ottomanism. Uh, just for the record, uh, I think we need to uh, uh, tell it. But let's look at last 10 years. I mean, Turkey, uh, before the Arab Spring started, uh, was again being accused uh, uh, as neo-Ottoman just because, you know, uh, it was getting along well with Iran and uh, Russia and again Syria. I mean, it was receiving a lot of flags from, especially from Washington, it just because, you know, it was using its soft power. And now after the Arab Spring, uh, you know, uh, famous zero uh, problems, zero problem. neighbors yeah. policy now, uh, you know, gone. And again, now Turkey is being accused as no Ottoman uh, because uh, it's not getting along with you know Iran and uh, and Syria especially. Uh, so the the bottom line is uh, Turkey is not the same Turkey uh, before 2000. Now uh, it has uh, you know different ambitions and aims and whatever it does now uh, with its you know uh, better economy. Uh, it's being accused as you no know, Ottomans at any rate, whatever it does. Okay, and what do you think about that? Uh, because, you know, a year and a half ago, Turkey didn't have very many problems with its neighbors. Now it has problems with almost everybody now. I think we need to distinguish between uh, two different foreign policy styles. Uh, one is what has already been going on, uh, that Turkey is becoming more dynamic and proactive in foreign policy and as an opposition member of the parliament I do support the new dynamism and proactive style in Turkish foreign policy. This however is quite different from what's also going on on the other hand and we can simply gloss it as a neo-Ottoman uh, style of foreign policy and this is a foreign policy that relies heavily on uh, Turkey's Sunni Muslim Mm -hmm. uh, partners uh, in the greater region. Moreover, uh, within Turkey, uh, in domestic politics, uh, there is the self-perception that Turkey is moving towards a new Ottoman policy. And you can hear this from many bureaucrats and also opinion leaders uh, in Turkey as well, uh, close to the government. Uh, and uh, what 
The second style of policy has brought us to is uh, all these emerging problems, mm. uh, not only in the immediate neighborhood of Turkey, but also in the regions beyond. Because uh, my colleagues in the Balkans, my colleagues in the Caucasus, my colleagues in North Africa uh, have repeatedly told me in our encounters that no one wants a big brother in the region mm. and no one wants Turkey to be involved in a neo-imperial, in a condescending style in these regions. Okay. Gareth, you know, a more activist foreign policy is risky, isn't it? I mean, we've seen that well, over the last year and a half. Absolutely, but also... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, abs absolutely. But I think you have to be very careful about what kind of activist uh, policy this is. I would actually take issue with Ilhan on, on, on this uh, idea that Dao Tolu isn't a neo-Ottomanist. He says he's not a neo-Ottomanist, but when you look at what he talks about, he talks about how everything was, was going very well up until the First World War. He talks about 400 years of peace and harmony in the Middle East. He talks about history reasserting its natural course. All of these are references to the Ottoman past. They may be slightly coded references, but they are ne there nevertheless. And the problem is that when you then pursue an activist foreign policy based upon uh, supremacism, you're going to run into problems. I don't think there's any question if you look at the people in the region, they're mostly Muslims. They'd much prefer to have good relations with Turkey and to be close to Turkey than they would be to be with countries outside the region, such as my own Britain, which has its own, uh, you know, imperial the past in the region. If they had to choose between Britain and Turkey, they much prefer to have good relations with Turkey. But the problem with Turkey, it's been trying to assert itself and tell other people what to do. If you talk to the people in the region, they want to be partners with, with Turkey. They don't want to be subjects. They don't want to be subordinates. And Turkey's activist foreign policy has been based on going around telling people what to do. We even have Erdogan last year went to Egypt and told a very conservative society they should be secular like Turkey was. This isn't a question of partnership. This is dictating to other people how they should behave and setting yourself up as a model for others to follow, which I think is extraordinarily uh, arrogant and also very insulting to the people to whom you're saying it. Okay, Ilhan, if I go back to you in Washington, is, but there's a competition for influence here. If we can look at Syria here and other proxies in the neighborhood getting involved in that. I mean, Turkey just wants to be part of the game, be part of the decision-making game. It's very, very dangerous when you're dealing with a civil war like this. <laughs> but I mean, the, the Turks are not alone in wanting to exert influence in the region. It's a competition. Uh, definitely. Uh, well, just, uh, I mean, l let me take uh, one issue with uh, uh, Mr. Icon. Uh, well, about the Sunni uh, part of the, you know, foreign policy that, you know, Turkey being accused as uh, uh, pursuing uh, Sunni. Well, Turkey also uh, wanted, you know, uh, wanted Gaddafi and Mubarak to leave the power uh, leaders, you know, the, the, these leaders were Sunnis. Uh, so, I mean, we, we mostly right now, the big problem in the region is Syria, obviously. Uh, many uh, of the Turkish uh, problems, foreign policy problems, stem from a Syria problem. And yes, there is a competition. Uh, it's, you know, uh, let's talk about Syria. It's next door uh, to uh, Turkey. Whatever happens in Syria, uh, you know, impacts Turkey in so many levels. Uh, so, I mean, I think Turkey had no other choice uh, but the uh, in certain degree involved with Syria, uh, and that's, you know, what uh, it did. I mean, you can uh, criticize Turkey. Well, you know, it's, it if, handled, I go, if I go to Ikan, let's, 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 uh, let's look at Syria, because, you know, at, before this, you know, before Turkey's stance, it could have been a mediator. It could have played a very different role, but it decided to go, uh, go against Assad. So, Ikan, what do you think about that? Because you know, the dynamic change there. I mean, the Syrians are not going to look at the Turks as being a mediator. Uh, I still insist that uh, Turkey's involvement uh, in the Middle East and North Africa uh, is one that works through uh, Sunni conservative partners. Uh, the, the case of Egypt and the case of Libya, I think, uh, prove my case. Uh, since uh, what we see on the rise in these two countries is uh, Muslim Brotherhood's uh, influence in politics. And we also see a similar trend uh, in Iraq, where Turkey is again at odds with the, the, the Shia uh, government. 
Uh, in Syria, uh, Turkey unfortunately has uh, acted in very sectarian ways and uh, has not uh, been a positive uh, support for democratization and institution building. Because I believe uh, we have two alternatives here vis-a-vis uh, -vis Syria. Uh, as the main opposition party, we agree uh, with the government that it's a human tragedy and the civilian killings should cease at once and we want democratization in Syria. But where we differ from the, uh, the Turkish government uh, is that we want an all-encompassing, participatory and transparent process in Syria which includes all stakeholders as legitimate partners in governing uh, a democratic Syria. The uh, AKP government, on the contrary, uh, when it comes to their stance in Syria, uh, is not only sectarian, but always focuses its influence on narrower segments of society and is leading, the Sir uh, is leading Syria to a majoritarian regime where fundamental rights and freedoms will not be secured. Okay, and we're, we're going to go to the break real quick here. Gareth, Gareth, don't you think the Turks should put, push democracy more than anything else? Because they actually have done a pretty good job. The Turks have done a good job in pushing democracy. Yes, I mean, if this is a model um, that can be exported, okay, there, a sense of a participatory democracy, okay, instead of the sectarian element. You put, yeah, but, but Turkey at the moment is becoming increasingly more undemocratic and more authoritarian. I mean, the, if Turkey was moving towards being a more liberal, participatory, pluralistic society, then I, I would agree. But when we look at Turkey itself, we're seeing it's increased authoritarianism, less, less democracy. And we're also seeing a double standard in terms okay, we'll go, we'll, of who Turkey is we'll supporting. We'll go back to you for a double standard supporting. when we come back from the break. After our short break, we'll continue our discussion on Turkey. Stay with RT. Okay, Gareth, I'd like to go back to you. At the end of the first segment, you used the term double standard. And on this program, when anyone says double standard, I go right back to them. So go ahead. <laughs> okay. Oh, what I was trying to say was when you look at Turkey's reaction, for example, to the uprisings in Bahrain right. in February 2011, where you had the uprising by a Shia majority against a very undemocratic Sunni ruling elite. And at that time, actually, Turkey sided with the Sunni elite. And that's a, a double standard. If you're now going to try to say that by supporting the opposition to Assad, you're supporting democracy. Also, you go back a couple of years for Turkey's support for the regime in Sudan, the Su Sunni regime in Sudan, which was perpetuating a, a genocide in Darfur. So I, I think we see, of course, Turkey is not alone in this. Other countries have been guilty of uh, double standards. But it does raise very serious questions about the uh, Turkish government's motivations if it try to pretend it's actually supporting democracy and not just people who it, with whom it happens to agree for sectarian reasons. Okay. Ilhan, if I go back to you in Washington, where is, what is the role of Islam if, if, there, if Turkey in, indeed is pursuing a, a new Ottoman agenda here, which the government, as you point out, denies? But, I mean, it's the, the region is so, um, there's so much strife when it comes to sectarian differences. Can religion, can Islam be that, that element to unify people? Apparently not. Uh, I mean, uh, before this question, which is a great question, I'm going to have to agree with Jared actually in terms of, you know, Turkish democracy and where it is heading. Unfortunately, uh, you know, in terms of standards of the democracy, freedom of press, and, you know, many other aspects that Turkey, the, the, you know, uh, the road Turkey is on, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't seem a good, uh, you know, having good role. and. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Turkey, uh, someone just told uh, a few days ago, uh, Turkey it can be a great economic model mm. maybe for the Middle East, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, for the time being, uh, uh, unfortunately, Turkey is becoming more authoritarian. And in, in terms of double standards, uh, well, again, I mean, Syria is a very different case. Syria is a neighbor. Uh, it's not Bahrain. It's not Sudan. It is neighbor. And, you know, as someone who's been to Syria uh, three times within this year, 
and uh, actually someone who got arrested by the Syrian regime. Uh, I was able to uh, uh, see uh, the Damascus suburbs in January, uh, how people got so tired of this regime. And, you know, I am taking uh, an issue uh, with uh, Icon, uh, Mr. Icon that, uh, you know, uh, those are great ideas, transparency, uh, you know, uh, transition to democracy. But where is the, uh, you know, authority in, in Damascus that, you know, can accept uh, those ideas? Uh, you know, Arab League uh, tried uh, for, uh, with the uh, peace mission, uh, Kofi Annan tried, now Brahim tried. Uh, so, I mean, uh, from, from the beginning, Damascus was not interested in uh, that kind of dialogue and you know whenever you talk to Syrian people uh, on the ground I talk, you know I was again in uh, Aleppo and Idlib in late August uh, people just you know don't trust this regime to go on another path okay to, but I mean you know icon in, in, in Istanbul I mean what is a positive role that Turkey can play now in resolving the situation in Syria because it's already taken aside. I think uh, Turkey is already uh, on the other side of the mirror vis-a-vis -vis Syria. That is, uh, I see a little chance of Turkey playing a positive role in Syria because we have already entrenched ourselves yep. uh, within Syria uh, through our support uh, for the insurgents, uh, our logistical support, our arms support, our financial support, uh, and which means that Turkey no longer has the legitimacy to speak to other stakeholders in Syria. Uh, and I, I do agree that uh, Assad's regime cannot continue as it does. And I do agree that uh, it was already a tyrannical uh, authoritarian regime uh, when Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan uh, befriended him and became best buddies for a while. Uh, but I still believe that uh, transition to democracy uh, rarely happens through uh, lots of bloodshed and uh, uh, civilian fighting and killing. Uh, and often what we need is a gra gradual transition, uh, often bringing in carrots and sticks from the international community. I know Assad is difficult to move in the right direction, uh, but uh, my take on democratization is that a gradual and incremental move towards uh, furthering fundamental rights and freedoms, uh, particularly with incentives and disincentives from the international uh, society, is always a better idea. Okay, Gareth, do you think that the Turks have burned their fingers already in Syria? There's no way out? I, I think we've got to that point now, unfortunately. I, I think there was a, an opportunity in the past when T Turkey could have played a more constructive role. And we even saw Assad uh, a few we uh, days ago, saying that his regime was prepared to talk to Turkey. Um, but uh, that was rejected out of hand by, by Turkey. So Turkey could also play a role in trying to encourage the uh, opposition to uh, have a more democratic, pluralistic agenda and be ready to condemn atrocities which are con or killings of civilians which are carried out by elements within the opposition. I think that would send a very strong signal if it didn't just condemn atrocities committed by one side, but um, condemn them when they were committed by both sides. But when you have a situation whereby Turkish artillery is now opening up yeah. on Assad's forces as soon as a shell crosses the border, regardless of where it's coming from, that doesn't look like yeah. a country which is in a position to be an interlocutor. Okay, Ilhan, if I go back to you in Washington, do you think the Turks are doing this because they're a member of NATO, that no matter how, far, how bad it gets, they can always look to their NATO friends to bail them out? even though the NATO, NATO forces don't look like they're interested in Syria, at least overtly right now. But it's, it's kind of an interesting situation to be in because you can be irresponsible. And I think, personally, Turkey has been irresponsible. Uh, definitely should be, you know, one of the reasons Turkey is more confident. I mean, you know, Turkey has been with NATO uh, more than uh, half a century. And, you know, it has been staunch ally in the, you know, Cold War and later on. Right. But when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, benefit from NATO, I, I don't know how many times Turkey benefits from NATO. And the, you know, current situation, 
uh, anyone who follows NATO and members of the NATO and, and you know, U.S. and the Obama administration's policies, I mean, you can see, uh, you know, uh, NATO chief Rasmussen, every other day he, you know, comes out and says NATO, uh, you know, has no interest in whatsoever to intervene in Syria. Every other day. I mean, I don't yes, think that, Yes, but nonetheless, that, you know, they are uh, in a NATO treaty organization. Confidence. It's a treaty organization. Gareth, what about this? I mean, if, 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 if Turkey wants to have greater influence in the region, can it stay a member of NATO? Because if it stays a member of NATO, it looks like it's a conduit of Washington. Absolutely. I think this is a major dilemma for Turkey. When Dawa Tolli, he wrote a book in 1991 called Civilizational Transformation and the Muslim World, which formed the basis of a much more famous book he wrote later, 10 years later, called Strategic Depth. And then in his first book, he was very explicit that Turkey needs to be uh, a member of an alternative security architecture, which is the way he put it, uh, to NATO. And I think that there is a very real danger now for Turkey that if it continues to have all these problems with different countries, and even with Egypt, relations aren't that, that good at the moment, it's going to look like a, a proxy for the West if it remains in NATO. And yet, if it leaves, it's also going to be very uh, isolated. I, I think you can, you can discuss how it's strategically or politically how much Turkey has gained from NATO membership, but in terms of technically, most of its equipment uh, comes from other NATO countries. It's, it's training. All of this is done in cooperation with NATO. So from a, a technical perspective, it, it has gained a lot. And if it forms some kind of alliance with other countries in the region, no other country in the region has the technology that could uh, match what Turkey can get from other NATO members. Icon, do you want to jump in on that? You know, Turkey and uh, its future in NATO? Uh, NATO to Turkey, I think, represents more than simply a, a security hedge. And NATO is, in fact, an anchor uh, together with the Council of Europe and together with Turkey's EU membership, uh, anchoring Turkey in uh, Western values, but what I really mean by Western values is basically human rights, fundamental rights and freedoms, um, gender equality, secularism, and so on and so forth. Because increasingly, Turkish citizens uh, see uh, the threats uh, posed to pluralistic democracy in Turkey by the rising charismatic authority of Erdogan, uh, and a charismatic authority uh, that uh, neither uh, respects uh, okay. opposition. Let me jump in here, Gareth. I'm going to give you the last word. Is, his own party. is Turkey going to the east or the west, or is it just staying right where it is? 40 seconds. Uh, I think Turkey is, is leaning towards the east, but it may find that its feet are still in the west. All righty, gentlemen. Thank you very much for a riveting discussion. Many thanks today to my guests in Istanbul and in Washington, and thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, cross talk rules.